I suppose everybody can hear me. It's 11 in La Belle Provence du Quebec, uh, so I suppose it must be 9 in Alberta, and uh, so we can start uh, the session on uh, population ecology. I'll be the moderator uh, for this session. My name is Marco Festa Bianchet, and uh, let's uh, start with uh, uh, the, first, uh, the first presentation. Uh, it'll be given by Steve uh, Wilson and Christine Small. Uh, Steve uh, is a consultant biology in British Columbia who specializes on uh, uh, resource uh, modeling and he got his PhD from the University of British Columbia. Christina Small is a professional agro agrologist with an MSc in geoenvironmental engineering. And today they'll present us their integrated population model for Rocky Mountain Bay or sheep in the Elk Valley, BC. So Steve, you can take it away and share your screen and show the presentation. Okay, it's coming up now. Wait for it to start. Okay, we're good? Yeah, looks good. Excellent. So thanks Marco and thanks very much to the Alberta committee for this great event given the circumstances and thanks to everybody for signing on first thing in the morning or uh, late morning, depending on where you are for the first presentation of the day. I'm sure it's going to be a good day. So what I'm talking about today is sheep in the Elk Valley. The Elk Valley has come up a couple of times before uh, already in this conference. Uh, I should point out that this is the this marks 20 years that I've been attending these symposia, uh, but this is the first time I've ever talked on sheep. All my pre previous presentations have been on goats, so this is a bit different for me. But it was a great project that I had the opportunity to work in work with uh, a great team in a great area. So this, the, what we're talking about here is the Elk Valley, which is the, the po population here that's numbered num number three, which spans the height of the Rockies right in southeastern British Columbia. And it's been brought up a couple of times on other talks. One of the most notable things about sheep in this area is that they have this interesting behavior where they're actually wintering at high elevations rather than low elevations. So because of significant snow loads in that valley, they move up to windswept slopes to be able to find forage rather than staying in the valley bottoms where there's uh, deep snow. We've also learned that the Elk Valley is a very busy place. So there's a long history of mining in the valley and also a number of other land uses. There's forestry and lots of people crawling around. So lots of things happening. But one of the nice things is that this subpopulation, what we're referring to today is the Elk Valley East subpopulation. So basically what's outlined in the red on this little map from the valley bottom up to the height of land. The nice thing is that this population appears certainly to be stable, maybe increasing a bit. This is data from Kim Poole. So Kim's been doing most of the flying there for several years. And you can see that there was up to 800 sheep counted in that, val in that subpopulation in that 2009-10 season, there was a die-off, a bit of a die-off due to a severe winter. I shouldn't, yeah, die-off is a too much, too strong a, a word, but a significant, um, significant mortality due to severe winter, which seems to have knocked things back a bit, but the population is, it seems to be doing quite well. But that doesn't mean that there aren't concerns with what's happening. And Kim and Jeremy actually were authors on the Kootenai Bighorn Sheep Management Plan, uh, did a great job outlining all of the concerns regionally with, with sheep. And these are all to a lesser extent, some lesser, but uh, that are, are operating in the Elk Valley. So um, things things are different depending on where you are in the region so but all of these are operating at least to some some amount in in the valley um, and so the purpose of this project was to capture basically all the information that we have uh, from research and monitoring in turn in, in addition to the 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 knowledge we have around the sheep population into a what we're calling an integrated model kind of an integrated management model that estimates the relationships among those key drivers of the bighorn sheep population. And the reason we wanna do this obviously is because we wanna ensure the long-term sustainability of sheep in the valley. And that means designing mitigations that are likely to counteract whatever stressors may be there. And to do that obviously in an evidence-based way and do those things that we think are most likely to have uh, the, the highest probability of success. 
And now, uh, as anybody, any of you have, many of you know from working in places where we have populations that are heavily studied, everybody's working on a certain slice of the, of the issue. So we have people doing surveys, there's camera tracks in the valley, uh, there's a lot of work that's been done on range quality. So that was Kyle's talk yesterday, if you caught that. So a great talk on, on, on the very detailed work that went on to assess the carrying capacity of the Elk Valley for, for, for uh, bighorn sheep. So everybody's working on different slices of the story. And then on top of that, we have all these stochastic and uncertain events happening as well. So despite our best predictions, there are things that have a probabilistic chance of happening. So severe winters could come along. Uh, obviously there's, there's this persistent uh, concern around health risks, predation pressures come and go. And of course the land use changes that are driven sometimes by global capital markets that we have no control over. So all of these things are coming together. And, but what we need to do, as I said, was have some way of being able to assess the, the, the expected effectiveness of our mitigation actions in relation to these different drivers. And we're not just doing things one at a time. So for instance, we could be doing something to reduce predators, but at the same time, enhancing range. So in the reality of management is sometimes we're doing more, more than one thing at a time. And so our approach was to start with a, what we call a cause and effect model, and then to set parameters using whatever data we had available. But when we're talking about cause and effects, there could be factors for which we don't necessarily have data for. So we wanted to be able to estimate uh, some of our parameters where we didn't have data from expert and local knowledge. And then from that, basically come to some kind of consensus on how that the entire system is operating and then from that, identify those key drivers and then propose the effectiveness of, of, um, of different mitigations. And then finally, the important thing, of course, is to test via adaptive management, something we talk about all the time, but we rarely implement. The point here is that once we have some, some uh, estimates of what the effectiveness of our mitigations should be in the future, then we can implement those tests and see how close we are to our predictions. Of course, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we don't necessarily expect that we are going to be bang on with our predictions on this, but we're hoping that we can line it up more or less in the right direction. And the, the, the most important thing is, is to learn from that and to, to incorporate those learnings back into our management regime in a transparent way. So that's really what we're trying to get at here. So in terms of the population drivers in this particular part of the world, we, we put them into these six big buckets, predation pressure, human-related mortality, health-related concerns, and then we have the habitat issues on the right-hand side, the habitat that those that animals are using in the winter, and then in the non-winter season, and then, of course, these severe winter events, which can affect the, the, um, the availability of uh, particularly that winter range those winter range areas if we get deep snows, for instance. Um, but there, of course, there are other effects if we get icing or certain conditions that can affect uh, mortality directly. And what we did is we put that together in what looks like a fairly complicated model. And it is kind of a complicated model. Things get complicated when you put things together in committees. And this was a committee built model. But I think it's a it's pretty good. And once you start pulling it apart, it's not all that complicated. So. Put it very simply, we, we did what we call a directed acyclic graph. So essentially a Bayesian network. It's called acyclic because we have these arrows that basically go from cause to effect, but we can't have cycles in those graphs because that would impl imply that the future is causing the past. So we don't want that. And then uh, what we the outcome of this model at the bottom is the probability of a positive population trend based on things that we can measure. So of course we can measure adult female survival, we can measure uh, on surveys our, our, um, our lamb U ratios, um, and, and we end up with, with nodes that are related to predator populations in the green, to uh, range conditions and kind of purpley color, severe weather events in the, in the pink, uh, human related mortality in the yellow, et cetera. And this is not a, a population dynamics model in the sense of um, uh, that we're trying to forecast future populations in a time step way. What we're doing is, is just saying, okay, given the conditions that we have in the valley at this time, 
what's the probability that those conditions are consistent with a positive population trend? And then we don't have to just look at current conditions. We could say, well, what if we change conditions to what they used to be in the past or what they could be in the future? What are, would those conditions be consistent with a positive or negative population trend? So that's what we were getting at. And the way I like to think about this is each one of these nodes is like a dial. And what we really wanna do is be able to simulate by turning that dial and seeing how turning that dial propagates through the model and changes all the dials and how it affects that dial at the bottom, which is the, is the population trend. Okay, now the good thing about working in this valley, as I said, it's a busy place and uh, this is an important population for First Nations, for stakeholders, and they're just nice to have around. And it's also a very big population as far as bighorn sheep go in British Columbia. So there's lots of data, lots of interest and lots of uh, groups that have invested in collecting that information. And so we have population size land use ratios, thanks to Kim's skillful flying. We have, uh, we have snow data from snow pillow um, stations. We have adult female survival. There was, but only for a couple of years, there was a collaring study that happened about 10 years ago. Again, Kim's great work. And we have human related mortality from all sources. And we're also monitoring through cameras in the valley uh, range use, not just by sheep, but also we're capturing um, predators. I say we, that's the global we. Uh, I'm the dumb analyst on this. Other people are doing the heavy lifting, that's for sure. And, uh, and then there's forage availability estimates, as I said, the work that Kyle presented yesterday. And uh, pneumonia history, although I say available data, there's actually no data because there hasn't been a pneumonia outbreak in this particular subpopulation. So we've been really lucky that way. Uh, but at the same time, there are things that we cannot estimate. So we're not sure about uh, how these range, the range effects affect our, the energetics of these animals. We don't have really good information on predation risk. And um, since we haven't had a pneumonia outbreak, we kind of have to take a guess at kind of line up, well, what's the likelihood that something like that could happen and what would be the, the outcomes of that? So there's some things that we need to fill in. And so I won't go over this because this is all related to Kyle's work. He, he did this yesterday, but there's good information, very detailed uh, empirical and modeling information related to winter range carrying capacity. And again, to that annual forage quality that's been measured in relation to escape terrain. So we know what's available to the sheep. And then uh, just a, a note on what we did on the expert elicitation. So we also got some information from the public. We had a public information session. We asked them a, a series of poll questions, uh, but for the experts, we prepared a workbook of specific questions on those nodes that we needed input for. And they gave probabilistic answers. What's the probability that's associated with what each one of these outcomes? And we also asked them to self-assess their confidence ratings. So people have different experiences in the valley and so some people were more confident than others and uh, then I collected those workbooks all that information was collated together using this what's called prior linear pooling which is a, a fancy way of saying we basically weighted it's a weighted average where the weights are associated with the confidence of each of the experts and then we gave them two iterate we did two iterations of that so they came up with their initial estimates and then we had a present, and then I presented back those results to them. And then everyone was given the opportunity to revise their inputs and then send them back. And that's what, what came, came out in the final model. And so you can see on the right hand side uh, the people who contributed to this. It was a great team to work with. We had a lot of great discussions. You recognize a lot of the names that are associated with, with the council in this meeting and in past meetings. Uh, so I, I won't go through all of these. These are just some examples of what these, these graphs look like. I'll just talk about this one in the top left-hand corner. This was in response to asking what uh, in, uh, related to predation pressure. So what's the likelihood that predation pressure in the, in the Elk Valley East is sufficient to cause a zero to 5% adult female mortality per year, five to 15, 15 to 25%. And so these are the pooled, uh, the, the pooled proportions that were assigned by the experts. And so 
in general, everybody thought that there wasn't uh, a huge problem with, with predation, the most likely outcome that it's that it being very low. And so there's a number of those graphs uh, that were used to populate these different pieces. And then we, we basically take all those graphs and we kind of turn them on their side. So that one that I was just talking about, which is the general predator pressure, we just took those, those three bars, turned them on their side, and they populate the, 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 uh, the percentages in, these, in the nodes uh, in our model. And then the range, uh, the, the carrying capacity work that Kyle referred to, there wasn't just one point estimate, obviously, there's actually a range. So we were able to provide some uncertainty so we can cover that, those ranges in this model. So we, we do what we can to assign data where we have it. And so we had, as, we, as I pointed out, data for quite a bit, few of these nodes, some we didn't. And then the point here is that now we could say, turn up the dial on predation pressure or turn it down and see how that propagates through. Now, once we have a model, we need to do a bit of a systems check. Our model prediction is generally consistent with our current observations. Are the contributions of those uh, lining up with our expectations and does the model uh, track with the output uh, that we're expected? And if so, then our model can serve as adaptive management hypotheses. So just a couple of graphs to show you around that model sensitivity piece that I just mentioned. If we look at just this first uh, variable winter range, uh, winter range carrying capacity, Assuming a population objective of 650 sheep, we can see that along here is the uh, carrying capacity. So if we turn up that node to, to provide more room for sheep, you can see what happens to the, pop, the expected population uh, growth where one is uh, stability here and what happens if you turn that down. So you have, we have a certain shape to that assuming 650 sheep on the landscape. We can do that across all of the inputs so the red line here is again that same one I just showed you, but you can see the, the shape of those in the the shape of the lines for all of those other uh, variables, um, all standardized on the same on, on the same curve here. So the steeper the curves, the more important those variables are, either in a positive or negative direction. And we can line those more uh, more clearly in what's called a tornado diagram, where if we take each one of those variables and turn it all the way down or turn it all the way up to 11 for the Spinal Tap uh, fans in the, in the audience and then align those from most important to least important. And what we find here is that most important, the things that come out on top are certainly those range conditions, winter range at the top, annual forage underneath, pneumonia risk, which is you know, important because again, we don't have data for it, but we, for management purposes, we need to estimate where it's coming out in terms of the relative risk and, and based on the information that we solicited from the experts, it comes out pretty high. In fact, the, even though it's a low probability, it has a high consequence. So as a result of that, it gets ranked fairly highway, highly. So we think that this is uh, gonna be useful for us in the future. And specifically, we wanna forecast those what if scenarios. What happens when we start turning those dials? There's kind of an infinite number of possibilities, but we wanna know what happens to the population if, for instance, we lose range, uh, we lose some winter range, et cetera. If we have changes in severe uh, weather events due to climate change, what happens if we do range enhancement? And what happens if we do more than one of those at a time? And then uh, we, we also wanna use the model to identify gaps and opportunities. So there are things we had to ask, ask experts for, so wouldn't it be great if we could replace that, those, those specific nodes with actual data? Could we collect that data? And then for those variables that are the models most sensitive to, what are our most uh, pressing um, uncertainties or gaps around that and what can we do to uh, affect that? And again, ultimately we want to identify mitigation opportunities, groups of actions that we think will have the greatest benefit and then use that to, uh, in a, an adaptive management framework to forecast the likelihood of uh, success in what we're trying to do. So I'm gonna stop there, I'm out of time. Thanks very much to everyone who worked on the project. Again, you'll recognize a lot of these names. It was a great team to work with and uh, I hope that we have a chance to work together again in the future. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, we have uh, a minute for questions. Uh, you can type them in the question answer uh, facility that you see at the bottom of your uh, 
of your screen. Uh, so far, the only question is Helen, who was very upset that apparently you missed their masters on the Elf of Elk Valley sheep, uh, which dates to several weeks ago, uh, several decades ago. And I suspect it has to make way, do with your remark that there's no pneumonia. How far back do you know that there hasn't been pneumonia in these? Uh... Oh, well, I was just taking other people's word for it, but I can't, I can't read Sanskrit. So I don't think I could uh, d d divine her thesis. That would be an additional issue, but there was a pneumonia episodic in 1983, which spilled into Alberta that I think it would have had to go through the study area because it came from British Columbia. Okay. Uh, there is another question. Oh no, we will ignore that one. It's uh, has gone full trans uh, Sanskrit. Uh, no, maybe there's another one. Uh, yes, uh, from, uh, I think this is from, well, Teske. Um, she'd be very interested to see what would happen if there was direct permanent loss of the winter range uh, due to mining. Happy to show you that, Irene. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, then there's a very long uh, uh, question from, from Bill and one from Grant. Uh, and unfortunately, we're running out of time, but luckily, uh, uh, Steve, please answer those in the in the question and answer uh, facility. Will do. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. So. Uh...